Changing the World, one of your fellow graduates from, I think a few years ago, maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago or so. He's here to deliver your great keynote address. Paul Dachi is a global number one best-selling author and favorite storyteller for the world. His books have been published in more than 45 different languages, and they're in more than 80 countries, with more than 130 million copies that have been sold worldwide. 130 million. He's, his works have been adapted for both feature films and television. David and his wife, Michelle, co-founded the Wish You Well Foundation, his mission is to support literacy programs across the United States. I want to ask his wife, Michelle Baldacci, to please stand. Where are you, Michelle? I can't see very well. I wanted to ask her to stand so that we can thank Michelle also everything that she has done in so many ways for David's alma mater, BCU. This is a person who has a tremendous sense of depth. She's a caring person. She's committed to society. And she too, like all of us at BCU, are committed to all of our people in the world and their success. So Michelle, thank you very much for being here. And thank you for all of your support of BCU. And of course, thank you for your support of David, our star alum. David is a Richmond native, and like all of you, he's a graduate of ECU. He's also a graduate of a law school down the road. He's done very well by them as well, University of Virginia. And David holds an honorary doctorate in Humane Letters from ECU, which was awarded to him way back about 18 years ago in May of 2001. So, please join me in welcoming back to his campus, David Baldacci, our keynote speaker. David, welcome. Well, that was a great introduction. I appreciate that. President Rao, distinguished faculty, parents, family members, friends, and most important of all, graduates on this momentous occasion. I was also a fall graduate of BCU back in 1983. Um, I was not at the graduation ceremony. They had to mail my diploma to me. So it's nice to be back with the gallon on. So. Many people ask me what it's like to be a best-selling novelist. You know, I can tell they think my life is outrageously cool, which greatly amuses my wife, who knows my life is much more like when she tells me it's trash night. Get on it. So in answer to that question, I tell them a story about my kids when they were little. I took my daughter to one of my book signings when she was five. The owner of the store asked her if she knew why all these people were here to see their dad. She said, yes, they're here because they want my dad to write his name in their book, and they will pay him for that because my dad has the nicest handwriting. Now, she must have passed this idea on to her little brother. My son has always been very entrepreneurial. So the first time I took him to a bookstore just to buy some books, we walked in, he saw all the books, all the people reading. It was like this light bulb went off in his head. And he started running across the bookstore at the top of his speed, screaming at the top of his lungs, my daddy will sign any book you've got for $2. You know, everything is so precise and planned out for young people these days. Just the right preschool, just the right number of activities. A 4.0 GPA is somehow looked down upon. This many AP courses, that magic target on the SAT. Things were a little simpler in my time. I had a fair GPA. I played some sports in high school. I took the SAT, I did okay. I sent out some applications and I graduated from high school. In late August, my mother asked me if I was planning to go to college. I said, yeah, I was. She said, well, you better get a move on. I asked, when does it start? 
Tomorrow, she said. I actually registered that very same day and started taking classes at VCU the next day. My brother and my sister had gone to VCU before me. It spoken highly of their experience. And it was important for me that one could work almost full time while one was earning their diploma at VCU, something that many still do to this day. My sophomore year, political science became my major. When my junior year came, my parents pointed out that a paying job might be nice after graduation. So I met with my advisor at VCU. I told her, I'm a political science major. She said, what does that mean? I said, well, I can write a paper on Machiavelli in which I can forcefully argue that he was not nearly as Machiavellian as he appeared to be. She said, so you're, you'll still be wanting a job. I said, isn't there anything I might be suitable for? She said, well, there is law school. Many people with no apparent skills often go on to law school. <laughs> what do lawyers do, I asked. She said, well, they dress in suits. They eat pretty well. They stand around and talk for hours. And they're paid by the word. Perfect, I said. Actually, I loved my time in law school, even though my classmates were all trying out for law review in Wood Court, while I was back in my little apartment writing short stories and daydreaming of becoming a writer one day. I graduated and started to work in Washington, D.C. I was a trial lawyer by day and followed my passion of writing late at night. And that's why I write. I have a passion for it. And make no mistake about it, Passion is really rare when it comes to one's work. Unfortunately, most people never find it in what they do for a living. And thus, if you do happen upon it, be very loath to part with it because the chances are very low that it will come around a second time in your life. And please don't settle for something in life when you can reach for something else. You know, you're very young right now, you have your whole life ahead of you, but None of us can get a do-over on our time on Earth. And don't forget, please, to have some fun along the way. But with that passion and that fun, I am duty-bound to say that you should try to earn some money, too. Your parents, I am sure, love you, but they also want to turn your bedroom into a he-she cave, so you got to get out. <laughs> really. Not that I've had this discussion with my own kids. Now, I could stand here, as I have listened to other commencement speakers, and scare you to death by saying that you will face more ominous challenges than any other generation in the history of the world. Good luck, I suppose, if I were standing here in 1861, or 1941, or 2001, I could say the very same thing. The truth is, all generations will be challenged in many ways, and you will be no exception. I have no doubt, and I echo President Rao's comments, I have no doubt that you will do many wonderful, world-changing things in your life. You will find cures for cancer. You will solve the problems associated with climate change. You will live to see the day where Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi hug. I was just kidding about that last one. <laughs> None of us have lived that long. In that same vein, many esteemed scholars will tell you that politics today has never been nastier and more personal. I minored in history at VCU. I read a lot of good books on a lot of good subjects, so let me give you some perspective on that. During the presidential campaign of 1800, Thomas Jefferson's camp called John Adams a, quote, hideous, hermaphroditical character, which has neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. 
In return, Adams, people called Jefferson, a mean-spirited, low-lived fellow, sired by a term I will refrain from using today. Later, they labeled Adams a fool, a hypocrite, a criminal, and a tyrant, and Jefferson a weakling, an atheist, a libertine, and a coward. During the presidential campaign of 1864, which pitted Abraham Lincoln against his former top general, George McClellan, for the nomination, Lincoln was called a, quote, filthy storyteller, a despot, a liar, a thief, a braggart, a buffoon, a usurper, a monster, ignorant aim, old scoundrel, a perjurer, a robber, a swindler, a tyrant, and a butcher. In those insults, came from his own political party. Damn. You can only imagine what the other side was calling him. Many years later, Harry Truman, campaigning for John F. Kennedy, said, if you vote for Richard Nixon, you ought to go to hell. Now, with that said, there is an appalling rancor across the country today. We have stopped listening to each other and have become blinders on tribes living in myriad bubbles across the country. However, disagreement will never equate with being an American. In fact, being an American requires us from time to time to disagree, to dissent, to break off from whatever majority rules the day. As Thomas Jefferson famously said, the difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. The people who first immigrated to this land did so to escape places that did not tolerate individual thinking. Thus, both by default and design, we are not a country of one size fits all. Here we can safely worship the God of our choice or no God at all. We can be a hawk or a dove, pro-choice or pro-life, physical conservative, a libertarian, a social liberal. We can fight against deficits and big government and still believe that the poor, the sick, and the undereducated are entitled to assistance and equal opportunity. I don't think it's one set of four beliefs or principles or values that makes America great. It's our individual diversity that makes us unique. Without that, America and what it truly represents ceases to exist. Indeed, some of the greatest events in this country's history have come from one person taking the path less traveled, or because one person stood up to a majority that she believed to be wrong. America has long been called a melting pot, and that's what we are, and always should remain. We've taken in the poor, the persecuted, the hungry, huddled masses, my grandparents included, and we've done so for centuries, and we are far better off for it. We are a shining beacon in a sometimes bleak world. Certainly we have problems and issues like every other nation, but so long as we have people who love this country and believe in the many outstanding principles for which it stands, the beacon of democracy will continue to shine on for centuries to come. Now, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, Winston Churchill, once said that democracy is the first form of government that we have, except for all the others. But democracy is a messy business and time consuming because it requires building consensus talking and listening to one another, and compromising. It cannot be a winner-take-all scenario. Yet sometimes people get frustrated and think things seem to be the stalemate. They sometimes clamor for one person to step in and make all the decisions. That's why authoritarian regimes are sprouting up all over the world in 2019. History has shown us that every time that happens, a disaster of epic proportions follow. Dictators initially require supporters, but once they consolidate power, they only need followers. 
and the followers will have no choice in the matter. Unfortunately, today I find many people of all ages and backgrounds disengaging from public discourse because it all seems so negative. However, when you do disengage when times are uncertain, you will ensure that America will turn into a country that none of us would want to live in. Thus, your democratic freedom comes with a responsibility, and it's an important one. And that responsibility is to be an active participant in your own governance. Nothing good will ever come from you shirking that sacred duty. So as you make your way in life, one of the best things you can do is listen to each other. Discuss civilly important issues. Change someone's opinion through a reasoned debate. But don't be dismayed when someone convinces you to change your mind. It's all about being a human being. Really, the only thing that can feed America, I think, is ourselves. One of our greatest presidents, the aforementioned old scoundrel, Abraham Lincoln, said it best, as he often did. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Thus, I would stand here in 1861, 1941, 2001, and certainly do so here today, and tell you that nothing, absolutely nothing, is worth this house of freedom ever falling. There is nothing as good that could possibly replace it or its own. The world awaits the class of 2019. Go get it. Thank you. David, thank you for those great words of wisdom, and more importantly, thank you for believing in all of Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's been down. <laughs> yeah.